Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Well, amen. Good morning. How are you? So I, I got to be honest with you, Danielle's a little bummed because Christmas is over and I'm really stoked. <laughs> I really am. I, I, you know, A-type personalities, uh, I, I've actually looked forward to getting back to a routine. I look forward to getting back to the office. I look forward to studying. I look forward to getting back into a routine. I don't know what today is. Uh, I'll be honest with you. Uh, anytime there's a gap like this and you get off your schedule, you, every day's Friday, every day's Saturday for me because I'm like, oh, dang, I got to preach tomorrow, you know, and so there's always that, that rush. So I, I'm kind of excited and, and I like the new year. Uh, how many of you guys are already working on your New Year's resolution? Anybody, be honest, overachievers, anyway. Uh, man, I, you know what, I hadn't even thought about it, honestly, but here, here's a thought that's been going through my mind over the last couple of weeks. You know, what, what is going to be the best thing you bring to the table in 2020? Have you thought about it? I mean, what, what, what would be the best thing? What would be the best thing you could bring to the table in 2020? Because see, if you're going to answer that, you got to answer this question, what controls you? Or who controls you, right? I, I know some of you have had one of those weeks this last week that, you know, you've had these thoughts in your head because you were with that uncle or maybe that mother-in-law or, or that father-in-law or that cousin, and, and you've had these thoughts that you've walked away from and go, I don't like them. Anybody? Be honest. Amen. Yeah. And, and then you shadow box for the next three days and you're shadow boxing right now, having a conversation with her and having a conversation with him and they're controlling you. I know, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? And how some people just influence your thoughts. I mean, I, I could say a certain family member for you, and some of you are already there, and, and your whole thought process for the next 20 minutes would be taken up, right? Or you'll walk away and go, man, that guy's a jerk, that girl's a jerk, or I feel so guilty. Because the conversation led somewhere, and then the hurt comes in. And you just replay those conversations over and over again, and then what we end up bringing to the table is less than. Because you see, some of us don't even have any idea what controls us. It's like you're just this impulsive creature. Anybody admit to that in the room? I have some impulses sometimes that I just go, where does that come from? Why do I do that? Why do I continue to do that, amen? See, James tells us that temptations begin in our desires. I'm not going to put this up on the scripture, on the, on the page, but, or on the screen, but James says each one of us are tempted when, when by our own evil desire we're dragged away and enticed. Listen, it's not someone else's fault. You fell into sin. Your own evil desires is what James says, what drug you there, amen? It's not because your mama and daddy did something to you growing up or church did something. It's your own evil desires that drug you there, amen? Yes, amen. I know. Happy New Year. <laughs> well, see, listen to me. Temptation is not a sin because some of you think just because you're tempted you're sinning, and it's not, because we're all tempted, aren't we? We all have those desires. Well, Romans chapter 8, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be there this morning, and I want to look at Romans chapter 8 and, and talk about this thing of the bucket of replenishment. In Romans chapter 8, we're, we're going to look at this because the whole chapter of Romans chapter 8 is about ownership of Christ, about who controls you about what controls you, who controls you, your attitudes, because I, I think we all struggle with that, and that's why Jesus died on the cross, is to break the bondage of sin in our life, yes. is to break the chains of sin, to, to, to those impulses, those sins, those attitudes that we have. 
is that's why Jesus went to the cross to break the power of the sin in our life. And so Paul just shoots really straight in Romans chapter eight. I love this passage because it's this contrasting picture between sin's ownership and the Holy Spirit's ownership. Who owns you? And it all depends on who's in you. So let's look at the contrast. In Romans chapter eight, verse five, he talks about the mind controlled by the sinful nature. Look at it. He says, for those who are living according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh which gratify the body. But those who are living according to the spirit, in other words, they set their minds on the things of the spirit, his will and his purposes. So here's what he said. He, from the very beginning, we know that the human heart, because of Adam and Eve's fall, we go all the way back to our grandparents, is, okay? They sinned and when they sinned and they were disobedient, every one of us have been born into sin from that, from that point. And so we, it doesn't matter what we do, it doesn't matter what happens, there's this propensity that we're looking for happiness, that we're looking for things to make us happy, to feel good and all that. But the problem is, is our thoughts and our, and our ways and the way we go about that is all out of sin. And so even when we begin to formulate a plan, or formulate a scheme, and even though all the sirens go off and we know we shouldn't be going that direction, we know we shouldn't be there, there's something at work in us that we want what we passionately desire. And that's the sin nature. That's that thing going on inside of us. That I may know the law. I may know what's right and wrong. But there's something in me. <laughs> I don't care. Anybody else? That's your sin nature. That's that thing that's in you. And if you've not been set free from that, from that law of sin and death, then the only thing that drives you is sin, which leads to death. I know, it sounds too simple, doesn't it? Sin becomes the driving force. Sin is the driving force of your decision making. Selfishness is the filter for your direction, and it leads to one place, death. That's why some of you, no matter what you do, no matter how it happens in your journey, you end up at the same place of destruction. And so you have to begin to ask yourself, what or who controls you? Is it the mindset on the flesh, the things that I want this and I want that and I want it now and it's not happening so I'm going to make it happen and I'm going to manipulate it? Listen, the mind that's set on the flesh leads to death. Read on. Romans 8. He goes on to say that now the mind of the flesh is death, both now and forever, because it pursues sin. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace, the spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God, both now and forever. The mind of the flesh, verse 7, with its sinful pursuits, is actively hostile toward God. It does not submit itself to God's law since it cannot. And those who are in the flesh, living a life that caters to sinful appetites and impulses, cannot please God. So Paul is going back and forth going, life in the spirit is, is this and, and life set on the flesh is this. And he's kind of contrasting this back and forth. And he says the sinful mind is hostile. In other words, it's an enemy of God. It doesn't submit to God's law. In fact, it can't submit to God's law. That the mind that's not set on the spirit, the mind that has not been made new in Christ cannot please God. That's why some of you in this room, can I just be really honest with you? You will never please God and never be at peace because you've never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ. You've come to church all your life and we're glad you're here. But listen, at some point, it's like living with someone, you need to take that step and marry them. Hello. Man, it gets quiet when I talk this way, amen? People get all mad at me and how dare you. And, but that, see, that's, the re that's why some of you can't find peace. You'll string a few days together, but you just keep ending up in that same spot. And God wants you to be at peace. Life and peace comes from the mind that's set on the spirit. And the only way we can set our mind on the spirit is if we've been regenerated in Christ Jesus through him who makes us new. That's it. You can't please God. In fact, if you're owned by your sinful nature, you don't make God a little upset, make him unhappy. Listen, you don't make him mad every once in a while. Listen, you can't please him. You're not going to please him. 
You see, before we came to Christ Jesus in this room, some of you in this room, before you came to Christ, you couldn't do anything because you just did whatever your flesh desired. But then when Jesus came into your journey and you submitted your life to Jesus Christ, everything changed. The words that jump off the page in this, in this passage in Romans chapter 8, verse 5, it's, it says, they set their minds. Look at it again. For those who are living according to the flesh, everybody say, set their minds. Set their minds. Sets their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are living according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Have you ever worked with concrete? You ever worked with glue? I love super glue. I love that. In fact, my son got a, a RC car, radio controlled car. It's one of those really fast ones, like 110 miles an hour, it feels like, in the backyard. You know, it's only about that long. It's just crazy. And he thinks it's cool. Let me get, try to climb trees, and it almost will. And, and so I was gone one day, and, and he broke the car. And it was his mom's fault that he broke the car. She wasn't even outside, right? It's always somebody else's fault, right? So I came in and they said, hey, we tried to glue it and it didn't work. And so I went outside and I got some Marine JB Weld. Do you ever use that stuff? I'm talking about you glue a kid to the wall with that, they're not moving, amen? <laughs> I'm just telling you, that's good stuff. I love it. And I fixed this car with that. And it's set. And it took about four to six hours you see, that's like concrete or glue. And some of us live according to the sinful nature because we are hardened in place. We are predicted. We don't have any other choice because you've done it. You were born that way. And so you're set in concrete. It's meaning that, is that sin is approached and accepted and persuaded over and over and over. You do the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again. You'll begin to believe you can't do anything else, but you'll also believe, begin to believe that it is right when it's in direct contradiction to the Spirit of God. That's our culture today. Because we've got the media parroting all this culture to us, and we who call ourselves Christians who should be concreted in the things of the Spirit, the mindset on the Spirit is life, the mindset on the, the flesh is death. We keep hearing it over and over again, and because our minds are not set on the Spirit of God and not set on the Word of God, we begin to believe that anything the culture says or the media says is right when it's in direct contradiction to the things of the Spirit that leads to death. See, we all have those circumstances that affect us and people that's going to come into our life that affect us. Shoot, I can drive down the road. I, I nearly T-boned somebody down at another church down the road that shall remain nameless, amen, on the way here today. And there was a thought that went through my mind that was not very spiritual for a guy that's supposed to preach on Sunday morning, amen. I didn't wave at them. I didn't tell them they were number one, but I wanted to. There's something wrong with that, Amen. And all of a sudden, here I am driving to church this morning, and I'm wrestling with this. I'm wrestling with this. See, here's the radical difference for those of us who are living our lives according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh nature. That the mind controlled by God's Spirit, we're no longer controlled by flesh and death. We're no longer hostile to God. We, we, we're, we're no longer not able to submit to the law of God. We're no longer able to, to do. In fact, we, we can now please God. I think that's why Paul, before he got to Romans chapter 8, everybody knows about Romans chapter 7. Because you may remember that where Paul basically said, man, I spent a long time in sin's prison. And he begins to share his journey. And he keeps starts sharing on the things I want to do, I can't do. And the things I don't want to do, I just keep on doing. And we love quoting that, don't we? Because it almost gives us permission to struggle. And we need that. But I think for some of us, it gives us permission to stay in sin. And that was not Paul's goal. That was not Paul's whole point in Romans 7 and Romans 8. And right back, and right in the middle of Romans 7 and that whole passage, he goes, man, I need something more. I'm a wretched man. Oh, I can't please God, even though I want to. I can't, and I'm struggling. And then right in the middle of it, he says, but thanks be to God in Romans 7, 25. In other words, this is not about me. I can't do it, and neither can you. He says, thanks be to God who delivers me through the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, it's through Jesus Christ that you're set free from your anger, from your sin, your flesh, 
Our mindset isn't changed because you know right from wrong. Listen, everybody in this room knows right from wrong. Amen? I mean, come on, let's be honest. Don't be all spiritual with me. You know what I'm talking about. We all know right from wrong. That doesn't change you because you can't do that in your own strength. Your mindset changes when Jesus reigns as your king. Not our president, not our governor, our king. Church, listen to me. We will never walk in the spirit unless he's our king. And that takes a submission of our hearts, our minds, and our will. See, the mind controlled by the spirit, he says, is life and peace in Romans 8. Is life and peace. So I begin to ask this question. Do you have life and peace? Our minds can't be filled with life and peace until they're controlled by the Spirit of God. Look at Romans 8, 9 through 11. However, here it goes like this contrast. You're not living in the flesh. You're not controlled by the sinful nature, but, but, in, but, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God lives in you. In other words, let me ask you a question. Does the Spirit of God live in you? And see, only you can answer that question. Does the Spirit, has there ever been a time in your journey where you've realized you're a sinner and your sin separates you from God? I know some of you have heard this all your life, you're checked out right now. Don't check out, listen to me. Because this is where some of you are struggling. This is why some of you are making some of the dumbest decisions you'll ever make and in 20 years you're going to look back and go, what the hell did I do? Amen? Amen. I don't get mad at me for that. Because that's where some of you are fixing to be. And I love you enough just to say that because this is where you are. This is where you are. And you need to answer the question, does the Spirit of God live in me? I didn't ask if you walked the aisle. I didn't ask and come and say if you prayed a magic prayer. I asked this, have you submitted your spirit to the Spirit of God and been made new? Because that's what Paul's talking about here. In fact, the Spirit of God lives in you, directing and guiding you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he doesn't belong to God. In other words, you're not a child of God. And if Christ lives in you, verse 10, though your natural body is dead because of sin, your spirit is alive because of righteousness, which he provides, talking about Jesus. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who lives in you in you. Listen to me. Dead men and women will not have life until they're resurrected. See, if we're born into death, which is sin, we're born into that, you will not have life until we've been resurrected. And by the way, a dead man cannot resurrect himself, and I've done enough funerals to prove it. Amen? I've done enough. I've been doing this almost 30 years, 31 years next year. I do more funerals than I do anything else. I'm telling you, a dead man cannot dictate his funeral. I was joking with my mother-in-law just a couple days ago, talking about her funeral. I said, you keep doing that. I'm going to have your funeral in a Baptist church. Amen? (laughs) She's like, you can't do that. I said, you can't do anything about it. (laughs) Amen? She can't. So be good to your kids. Amen? (laughs) Amen? Listen, dead men and women don't have life until they're resurrected. And and literally, that means they've got to be born again. And you can only be born again through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Everybody in the world is God's creation. Oh, but Edward, we're all God's creation. Yes, you are. But you are not his child until you enter in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that's when you become a son or a daughter of God, adopted into the kingdom by the blood of Jesus. Now, you may be God's creation, and you're beautiful, amen? That doesn't make you his child. It's not until we're adopted in through Jesus Christ. And God, even as his children, God has children. He doesn't have children that he just lets live any way they want to. You ever been around a kid that lives any way he wants to? Do you know how miserable that kid is? Amen? And I'm not going to name any names of anybody in the room, okay? But we all know that kid or those kids or that whole grade. (laughs) Thank you. Yeah. You see, our thoughts control our actions. Our beliefs control our actions. And if we're going to operate in the kingdom, then we got to start thinking like the kingdom. 
if we're going to operate in, in 2020, if we're going to bring our best to the table, then we, we've got to be controlled by the Spirit. Look at Romans 8, 12 through 14. So then, brothers and sisters, we have a what? What's that word? Obligation. Say it again. We have a what? Obligation. We have a what? Obligation. Well, that almost sounds like we have to do something. How many of you like to be told what to do? Anybody want to get up and sign up for that? We don't, do we? And here's Paul writing to the children of God. So then, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation. This is what you must do. In other words, we no longer have an obligation to the flesh, our human nature, our worldliness, our sinful capacity to live according to the impulses of the flesh, our nature without the Holy Spirit. For if you are living according to the pulses of the flesh, you're going to what? Die. Die. But if you are living by the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually, everybody say habitually. habitually. You're habitually putting to death the sinful deeds of the body. You'll really live forever, he says, for all who are allowing themselves to be led by the Spirit are son, or by the Spirit of God are sons, or you can fill in, daughters of God. See, listen to me. We have a responsibility. You can live with the mindset on the flesh. But understand what Paul's saying. That leads to death. And you've been rescued from that. And so Paul is saying, don't live by that of the mind set on the flesh. Live with the mind set on the spirit. Why? Because the spirit brings life and peace. Go to that next slide, guys. Because that, this whole idea of, of the bucket, you see that bucket on the left. It, imagine that bucket being your life. Here's what I know about our life. Your life is constantly what you put in is coming out. Amen? You realize that? So whatever you're putting in your life is going to eventually come in, come out. It's that old thing in the 70s and 80s for some of you old enough to remember it when computers became big. Garbage in. Garbage. Whatever you're putting in is going to come out. And listen, that principle applies both good and bad. Because here's the thing. When we are living by life in the spirit, we're serving. Well, guess what? You go and pour yourself out in serving. And guess what? You got to fill yourself back up. Amen. So there's this constant flow going on in our journey that what we're pouring in is either going to be of the flesh or the spirit. But even if it's of the flesh, it's going to drain out. So you're going to be putting those things back in. But if it's of the spirit, you're going to be putting those things in because it's going to keep pouring out too. So it's this whole idea of the replenishment. It's this concept that we're filled and drained on a daily, a weekly, a yearly basis. And let's be honest, some of you are worn out from 2019, amen? amen. Man, you've been poured out. I don't know how many times we'll sit at the house and go, man, they have had a really rough year. Some of you are worn out because of your marriage. Because that's all you do is give, give, give. And that's all you concentrate on. And can I just say this? If that's all you concentrate on, you're going to miss what God really wants to do in your marriage because you're making it really all about you. Some of you are just really worn out and pouring out because of your jobs and church and relationships. You see, Paul talks about that. In Philippians 2, 14 through 17, he's saying, he's encouraging the Philippians to do everything without complaining. And he's just, he's, he's just encouraging them. Then he comes down to verse 17. And he says this, look at it. This is so good. He says, but even if I'm being what? Poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith for preaching the message of salvation, then guess what? I rejoice and I share my joy with all of you. And it's amazing that, that Paul says that because Paul's tired. I mean, he's, he, he, he has totally poured out his life. And the situation in the Philippians is that, that Paul is actually in prison in Rome. And he's writing this from prison, man. How many of you guys would write that from prison? I know some of you have been there, Amen. That you would write, man, I'm just so glad to be here. Because see, you probably wasn't there because of Christ's sake, amen? He was there because of Jesus. Totally different reason, amen? I know. He's not even sure he's going to get his life out of this prison. But he basically says, you know what? If this is what it means to live for Christ, I'll do it. 
I'm being poured out here. I'm being poured out here to express my joy that God's gonna use me even from jail. And he uses this term drink offering. In the Old Testament, the drink offering in Genesis 35 and Exodus 29 talks about pouring out a drink offering on the uh, altar that you're actually wasting it and pouring it out. And some, some believe that that's what Paul was referring to. Others believe that because Paul was writing in an ancient Greece here in Rome and, 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 and to the Philippians that he was writing about the pagan way of pouring out. And so what the pagans would do is they would take and uh, they would pave the way with prayer by pouring out wine, okay? They'd pour out wine on that. And so even today, you'll find some people from the Middle East that before they drink their wine, they'll pour a little bit out as a tradition because they want to make that sacrifice before they take that drink to give a little bit, kind of that tithe in that. And, and so Paul here is uh, coming to saying that he is being poured out, whether it's from the Old Testament view or from that ancient Greek uh, view. But either way, here's what he means. Here's what he says. He says both of these would involve taking a measure of wine instead of using it for a personal experience and for personal pleasure. I'm going to pour it out. I'm going to pour it out as a sacrifice that would please the God who was its object. In other words, here's what Paul was saying. In other words, I'm, I am willing to be wasted, to be poured out. In fact, I already am. I'm already being poured out. He said, I'm being poured out as a drink offering, almost comparing himself to a glass of wine, that a glass of wine that's poured over the altar. Paul's saying that I am pouring out. And by the way, Paul wasn't just being poured out in prison. His whole journey with Christ was representative of this metaphor, that his whole journey was one of being poured out. In fact, if you read 2 Timothy 4, 6, Paul writes young Timothy, says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. That's that same Greek word there that he's used in Philippians. And Paul over and over again uses this metaphor. In other words, I'm being poured out. And the truth is that Paul's life was only poured out at the very end. At the conclusion, it was a part of his journey that for him to walk with Christ meant to be poured out. He gave up all that was important to him. He speaks about this later in Philippians, about his background, his heritage, his religious heritage, his accomplishments. And he says, I count all those as loss in comparison to what Jesus Christ has done for me. And I'll give them up all. I'll give up all of them. In fact, he did. He walked away from it all. And spending, instead of spending his whole life in what I want, what I need, See, what I find out is when I start using the word I need, and that's really about Edward. Very seldom is it about my family. Very seldom is it about Summit Heights. Very seldom is it about God. I need. I have to step back at that moment and begin to ask myself, is that of the flesh or the spirit? Because I can just be really honest with you. There's very few things in this life I need outside of food and water. Isn't that true? Isn't that true? Now, I want a Corvette. Can I get an amen? Amen, amen yeah. I want a 21-foot Skeeter bass boat. Amen? amen? That's a want, a need. There's a whole other issue. You see, the whole thing, his whole life, was not about his pleasures, his family, his career. It was about, in a sense, of a drink offering. In fact, he goes on in Philippians chapter four when he's writing the Philippian church and he says, everything that Jesus did, imitate it. If Jesus did it, imitate it. You wanna be like him, you wanna be in the spirit, then start imitating Jesus. It means that the things that he did, we imitate them. Well, guess what? Jesus poured out his life for us. He's calling us to pour out our lives for others. There's things in our life that people tell us all the time, you have a right to have that. No, you don't. No, you don't. You see, here's the whole paradox of walking with Jesus. We're dead and we're made alive and then we lay our life down. Right. And by laying our life down, we are simply submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so guess what? If a dead man has no rights on this side and he's made alive here, and he lays his life down here and dies to self, he still has no rights. And the only right he has here is only based on the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did here. 
Amen? So the question is, not will your life be poured out, because it will. The real question is, on what will you have it poured out? Is it going to be a career? Is it going to be over your toys? Brother and I were fishing this last week. I've got to spend a ton of time with my brother. And we were talking about people's toys and razors and houses, not, not razors, but like the kind you drive, um, and, and all these things that we as men feel like we got to have. And we, we always, my brother and I have always said this for years, one of these days we'll be rich. Now, we're getting into our 50s, and we've been saying that since we were in our 20s, amen? It, it, it hadn't happened yet, but we, we're still holding out, right? And so... Um, and we keep saying, one of these days we'll have that, one of these days, because there's always this whole idea because men will pour their lives out for so many things. And you will. And, and ladies, you're not to be left out here because you'll pour your lives out for so many things. It's not a question of will your life be poured out. It's on what will it be poured out. And this, you have a choice. You can choose to pour your life out on leisure, self-centered pleasures, personal pursuits of happiness, you can fill that bucket up with all those things and turn that spigot off. It's mine, it's mine, it's mine, it's mine. But that's not what we've been called to. That's not what we've been called to. You see, we have a choice and the filter we use to control our thinking is the word of God. It's those things that we put into our life. It's the Holy Spirit filling us and taking the word of God. It's our way of worshiping him on a daily basis to be in his word and know what his word says and know what he's talking about. Turn off the news. Turn off your blog. Turn off your device. Get into the word of God, the thing that feeds your spirit. Amen. That's why some of you are dying. That's why you don't have life and peace. Because you are pouring your life out over a culture that is dying. It's the very reason that Paul encouraged the Roman Christians in Romans 12 too. look at it. He says, do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs. Be transformed and progressively changed as you mature spiritually, he says, by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly uh, values and ethical attitudes so that you may prove for yourselves what the will of God is, which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan and purpose for you. And see, many people ask me this question, Edward, what's the will of God? Well, are you gonna be conformed or transformed? Because you have a choice. And the reason so many people can't figure out the will of God is because they're conforming to the world and not being transformed by the word of God. It's just pretty simple, in fact. You can live conformed or you can live transformed by the renewing of our minds through his word, through his spirit daily, being full of life and peace. And see, this is real worship. This is how we live daily. See, for many of you, what you're going to bring to the table in 2020 is going to be all about being conformed to the world. And you're going to be here every week, and we're glad. You're welcome. Keep coming. But listen to me. As a believer in Jesus Christ who's been transformed, then begin to fill your life, to be transformed. Allow him to transform your attitudes, your wills, your words, your actions. Every, allow him to transform it so that you may be full and listen, when that gets drained out and you begin to feel that, that conforming, that's a warning. That's a warning that you need to go back and you need to be transformed again. Listen, this is a daily occurrence in worship and prayer and God's word and being transformed. Amen. And see, some of us just push right on through warning. And some of you are in danger right now. Because you know you have a relationship with Jesus. But you're choosing to be conformed and not transformed. Because men are just angry. That's just who we are. And that's a lie from the pit of hell, man. You're not angry if you're in Jesus. And he wants to set you free. And by the way, you probably aren't going to get set free on your own. You're going to need help getting set free in that bondage. You're going to need somebody to come along beside you and help you. Well, I'm just going to pull myself up by my bootstraps and make it work. How's that working for you? about 25 years for some of you. 
And it just gets worse and worse. And she's getting tired. Because we're conformed. And he's called us to be transformed. So that we can be full of life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh leads to death. The mindset on the spirit leads to what? Life and peace. Everybody say it with me. It leads to what? Life and peace. Say it with me again. It leads to what? The mindset on the flesh leads to death, but the mindset on the spirit leads to life and peace. See, it's the first thing out of your mouth when someone pulls out in front of you. <laughs> I can't even say. <laughs> well, if your blood pressure goes up and that's your first response, then you might want to step back and ask the question, is the mindset on death or is the mindset on the spirit? Life and peace. You see, some of us are living in that danger zone. And I just got to wonder what would happen if you begin to put your thoughts into captivity. If you begin to transform your mind and started desiring the things of God and started living in the realm of the spirit and understood life and peace. See, listen, here's what I would say to you. The best thing you can bring to the table every day, every week, and every year in 2020 is a bucket filled that's right with God is that you and I would be filled up with all the things that are right with God. That the things that begin to flow out of us would be the things of God. To stay filled and see what happens. Because see, here's what I know. If you run on empty long enough, you will slowly wither away. So I want to close with this story this morning. It's a story from the New Testament and it's a parable it, that Jesus was saying the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. Uh, Daniel, throw me those mustard seeds right there. I think I left them down there. Um, he's talking about faith and mustard seeds. And this bottle is full of mustard seeds. And I've, I've shown you this before, but I keep coming back to this because we forget that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And that's what Jesus was telling his disciples and teaching them on that day. He says, listen, guys, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And you go, how can that be like the kingdom of God? I mean, you can see the size of those seeds, right? And you're going, but that's so little. How can the kingdom of God be so little? How can it be so small? In the ancient Near East, the kingdom of God was small. And Jesus is saying that it looks insignificant what God's doing. It looks powerless. In fact, what God's doing in you right now looks like nothing. That's why you struggle. Because you can't see what God's doing. And here's what you need to hear this morning. And see, for some of you, for so long, you felt so insignificant. God can't use me. And it seems like God just kind of has left you in that same spot for three years. Part of that's because he has left you, amen? And you need to be there. For others of you, you're stuck there by your own choices. But he says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. It's so small and so little. But actually, God's doing something. God's doing something in you with that seed, that the kingdom of God is advancing. If you'll submit to his spirit over and over and over again, daily, over and over again, here's what'll happen to that little bitty seed. It'll grow into a mighty tree. It'll grow into a mighty tree. But listen to me, listen to me, listen, this is huge. Because you'll begin to experience life and peace, but it's gonna take some time. And see, I think that's the lie of the enemy for all of us is that we want it now, don't we? Well, who's that about? Honestly, who's that about? That's about us. I want it now. I want to see it now, God. But don't forget the context. When Jesus was walking the earth, he didn't look very powerful. It was Herod who had massive temples. It was Rome in its glorious moment in history. Athens had Plato and Aristotle. And here's Jesus teaching to a bunch of unlearned farmers. A bunch of rednecks out in the woods. And we got Herod. We got Rome. We got all of this incredible world. And here's Jesus teaching to a bunch of rednecks. Now all of us are going, well, yeah, ain't nothing wrong with that. Because you're a bunch of rednecks, amen? 
but how sig- insignificant it looked, how small it looked. Jesus didn't overwhelm people with his intellect and his wisdom or his size. You see, the smallness of the kingdom has always been a scandal, and it always will be. See, some of you think God's quit using you, and he stopped using you. I know when we first started this church and I came onto the scene six months afterwards, how many times God has stopped me with these harebrained ideas that I go to the elders with and I, I get excited and, and I used to jump a whole lot. Then I got old and fat and I couldn't jump anymore and, and uh, now I've lost some weight so I'll start jumping again. But anyway, uh, I'd get excited. I'd be in these meetings. Oh gosh, we're going to do this and we're going to take over Mineola and we're going to take over Kilgore and we're going to take over Gilmer and we're going to take over Longview. And I would just be, I'd be and the guys would be going, dude, stop. Let's just go back to Hawkins. I think about how many times God stopped me in those early days. Because I was trying to be big and fast. You see, things are not always as they appear. And listen to me, Judas did not sign up for the mustard seed. In fact, Judas, you know what he did? He quit that church, went to another church, and he died. Because he didn't sign up for the mustard seed. See, and some of you are frustrated because you signed up to be fixed now. You didn't sign up for the mustard seed. It's taking too long. That's why some people get mad and leave and go somewhere else. That's why some of you will go find another wife or another husband. That's why you'll go into debt. Because next month you're going to start getting all those credit card offers because you created all that credit last month. Amen? And they're going to give you a chance to create more next month. And you're going to take things into your own hands. We didn't sign up for that, didn't we? I'm so glad God didn't answer all my prayers in the early days of Summit because I'm going to tell you this right now, I would have wrecked this place. Can I just be honest with you? I'm grateful for men, our elders that sat around me for years, that God hadn't answered every one of my prayers. Because I'd have wrecked it. Because I wasn't ready. Because God was still doing stuff in me and my character. And can I just tell you this? He's still doing things in my character and my marriage and my maturity that I can't see. And so in those moments, because I know this is where some of you are, where I think we're going backwards in reality, it's hard to see that you're going forward. Because the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. And the mindset on the spirit is moving forward in the kingdom of God. Now you may not, you may not be running at that pace at others because you're always looking at that other church or that other marriage or that highlight reel on Instagram or Facebook and going, why do they get all that good stuff? And that's where you get all frustrated because nobody signed up for the mustard seed, did they? You see, learning emotionally healthy skills is slow. Growing spiritually and emotionally and physically Year after year, plugging along, little by little. I remember a counselor told me years ago in marriage counseling, Edward, don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. If you'll be obedient and you'll keep walking forward and you'll keep your mindset on Christ, you'll wake up one day, one day down the road. I can't tell you how long. I can't tell you when. I can't tell you the moment. But I'm telling you, if you'll be obedient, if you'll continue the journey, stay the course. And you'll wake up one day and you'll have a great marriage. And you know what? He was right. He was right. But we've had to work our tails off for it. And we continue to work our tails off for it today. If you want a relationship with God, you don't work for that relationship. He puts the spirit in you. Your work is to submit to that relationship and be obedient. To be obedient in that. God's ways are always little. And and, and most of the time, I'm going to say this, they're slow when we think of slow. Because we want it in three minutes or less at the Whataburger with a milkshake. Amen? That's the way we work. I know. You see, the greatest lessons that's come out of Summit Heights for me has come out of failure and suffering. And they continue to be that. 
And that's why some of you are attracted here. So here, here's my invitation. Here, here's my thing for you this morning. We're going to go home. It's to remain in Jesus even when you want to quit. Is that we would remain in Jesus, to stay with him even when we see nothing happening. And that is some of the most frustrating journeys, I'm, I'll be honest with you, is when I don't see anything happening of keeping that faith in place, concreted on the spirit of God because life and peace is there. That the kingdom of God has always been a mustard seed. And then all of a sudden we wake up and it's a massive tree of faith. You may not think your life is worth much. You may not feel like you've accomplished much. You may not feel like God's given you much. You may be that one talent guy just plugging along. But I want to tell you this. Your life is greater than you think. God's doing something in you. He's assigned to you tasks that were specifically for you. Amen. Not me. See, what God's given to you, I can't do. Because he's designed it for you. And the things that God's designed for me, you can't do. Because he's designed them for me. And that's everybody in this room. The mind set on the flesh is death. And the mind set on the spirit is life and peace. Listen, the best thing you can bring to the table every day, every week, every year is a filled up bucket that's right with God. So here's my question for you and we're gonna go home. What are you filling the bucket with? Death or life? And if you want to know which one, look what's coming out. Come on. Look what's coming out. And you'll find out who you belong to. Okay, let's pray. Father, I love you. Thank you for today. Thank you for this incredible time. We can worship. Thank you that we can um, come to this place on a holiday weekend. Sandwiched between two crazy times in our journey and worship you. Lord, I love you. Thank you for those that are here this morning. And God, I pray for those ones that are, God, they're looking at 2020 and they're not excited because they, they're just wanting more. God, I pray that you would give us more, but give us what we can handle to walk and to grow in you. Stretch our faith that we may be more like you. I love you. I thank you for Jesus. And it's his, his beautiful name we pray. Everybody said. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ. Or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day. And listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.